imagery and conceit. And this is something that's going to come up all throughout Dunn's poetry. Characteristic of the metaphysical style, Dunn's imagery is far reaching, it's outlandish at times. And he also uses conceit. It comes from the Latin idea of concept and really a conceit is an extended metaphor. And we'll see this play into not only his romantic poetry here, but his religious poetry. So imagery and conceit. John Dunn's Good Morrow, another Obad. I wonder by my troth, what thou and I did till we loved. Were we not weaned till then? Again, we have the dramatic voice addressing a woman whom he's in love with in the morning. Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? What was our existence before we love? He almost can't fathom it. And notice the imagery here. The conceit is that of childhood, not only that, but of nursing. And this, it's almost crass. Uh, they've got this vulgarity here uh, that in a way deliberately unpoetic weaned because he's he's almost scorning that past existence which to him is as shadowy now as his infancy what did we do were we nursing like like infants or snorted or snored we in seven sleepers din here's an example of an outlandish image seven sleepers din this refers to an to an old early church legend about these seven Christians who lived in Ephesus and were escaping the persecution of Christians by the Roman government in the first century. And so they went and hid in a cave and they fell asleep and they woke up 200, 300 years later. And when they came out, they found that the Roman government was no longer persecuting Christians. In fact, the Roman government had become Christian itself. And so there was this radical transformation that happened somewhere uh, in in sleep. And so there's a radical transformation that's happened in the lovers now, where now they can't even imagine what their life was before. Twas so, he says, but this, except this, that all pleasures fancies be. Fancies comes from the Greek fantasian, which means like a false mirage or an image of the mind. Pleasures are not fancies. If ever any beauty I did see, which I desired and got, was but a dream of thee. Playing on this, this old conceit of previous lovers being only types and shadows of the real thing shows up in Shakespeare's Sonnet 106 and many of the love poets in the Elizabethan period. And notice how he, he, he ends this stanza by doing exactly what he did in The Rising Sun, ending with perfect iambic rhythm. It was but a dream of thee. And it's a nice conclusion to the sense. So notice these images and what they're doing. Strangely introduced, but working with the logic of the lyric. And now, good morrow to our waking souls. And now they're waking up, which watch not one another out of fear, as the seven sleepers did, went into the cave out of fear, came out suddenly in this new transformed world. For love, all love of other sights controls and makes one little room in everywhere. Let's see discoverers to new worlds have gone. Ah, notice how he's introducing the imagery of exploration. Let maps to other worlds on worlds have shown. See this compulsive repetition of the word, word worlds? Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. Here is this spiritual unity that Dunn is just fascinated with in much of his love poetry. The idea that the two become one flesh, going back to the biblical uh, New Testament idea of marriage, uh, spoken by Jesus in Mark 10 and also by St. Paul in Ephesians, saying that a man shall, shall leave his uh, mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now uh, Dunn is using this uh, Pauline theology of marriage, to combine it into this cosmic fusion. Each is one world. Each hath one world and is one world. We've got this ellipsis here. Uh, the figure of anaphora, the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of successive lines, repetition of worlds, and this ellipsis or the omission of a word. Uh, we, we, under, we understand what's being spoken of here. Implicit, we each hath one world and each is one world. Strange imagery that's now moved from regional to cosmic or global platonic fusion here. So see how he's, he's getting metaphysical. He's getting speculative. He's using 
theology, philosophy, scholastic metaphysics to enhance his argument through this strange imagery. Now look at this. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. So notice the repetition here. This is called a chiasmus. They're very structurally sound, these lines. My and thine, thine and my. This is a chiasmus. It's like a geometrical mirroring. We have symmetry here. And true playing hearts do in the faces rest. The imagery has moved from this ocular face now to figural heart and faces rest. And now global, uh, as if we've gone into cartography now, where can we find two better hemispheres without sharp north, without declining west? You see this mixing of, of imagery, this mixing of metaphors, often called catachresis. This is characteristic of many of Dunn's poems. And so you see how the imagery is, is getting stranger and it's building on itself. Now we have a very logical statement. Whatever dies was not mixed equally. Okay, this is a proposition. If our two loves be one, and thou and I love so alike that none can slacken, here's an antecedent, like a logical syllogism, then none can die. Here's the consequent. Uh, so it, it, it's mounting up. Many of these images are used to mount up to a particular argument. And the strangeness of the imagery adds a specious authenticity to, to the argument. We, we almost believe it. Say, we can't die then because whatever dies was not mixed equally. And since we are mixed equally because we love so alike that none can slacken, therefore we cannot die. And so through logic, he's established basically a fiction of immortality.